Venom! Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog. And today what we're going to do is go over a couple of issues that were actually donated to us or given to us by Cam, uh, who is someone who's been watching the channel for a while and reached out to me and was like, hey, you know, I like hearing you talk about the Venom comics. And I know, you know, financially, you're just not going to be able to get all the you know, the tie-ins that are coming out because there's just so many of them. So Cam offered to donate those to us so we can have more videos and talk more about King and Black. And I want to just say, you know, take a minute here and say thank you very much to Cam. Um, Cam is an awesome person. I've been getting to know Cam a little bit more through like email and stuff like that. And hopefully at one point I can have Cam on the Parasite podcast. I would really like that. And I'm also going to try to reach out to more people after I get through March, um, I have a busy month in March with work and then other things I'm doing. Uh, but hopefully after March, I'll be able to get back into inviting more and more people on the Parasite podcast. And maybe we can do like another round of, you know, 10 or 15, 20 episodes, something like that. Uh, but Cam is definitely someone I'd like to get on if, you know, Cam is interested. Uh, but uh, but I, I want to just say thank you. And that's why I have that little intro at the beginning so that I always remember that to thank Cam, uh, you know, and that you guys see, you know, uh, you know, who is providing this content. So technically this is a sponsored episode in a way, uh, but just by someone out there who watches the show and just enjoys hearing me talk about uh, Venom stuff, even when we disagree, which is just really cool uh, of Cam to do that. So Cam, thank you for all the books we're going to talk about today. Uh, we do have quite a few, and I thought for the first episode, I was only going to do like two or three books, but I figured, well, some of these books don't have a lot to, to uh, do with King and Black. I mean, they tie in very loosely, but the stories are just kind of very simple and they're easy to go over. So that's why I decided to cram a bunch of them in this first episode, and then maybe as we go on, I'll do less and talk more, depending on how deep into the you know King and Black lore each issue belongs, you know, or like each issue provides us, I guess, and you know, uh, how, how, what, where in the, the timeline it belongs. And I think there's like Symbiote Spider-Man. I'm going to save that for when we talk more about Peter Parker and the black costume. So that one I'm intentionally saving and I've been buying on my own. Uh, but Cam has pretty much given us digital codes for every other book that is King and Black related. So Cam, one, I hope you're enjoying these tie-ins out there and everyone else who's watching, I hope you are too. Of course, I'm critical on some things, but uh, I will say for the most part, these tie-ins are well done as far as like the stories in them. But the thing that they're bad at is like me caring that they take place during King and Black. I think that's the biggest thing I have an issue with. So we'll go over some today. So the first one we're going to talk about is uh, the first one that Cam sent me, which is uh, Atlantis Attacks number five. Now, this one is pretty neat. I mean, it's uh, written by Greg Pak. Um, art is by Robert Gill and Ario Inedito. Uh, and, um, you know, great team on it overall. Like the book looked good. I like the action in it. And I guess like I'm lost because I haven't read the first four issues, obviously. So what it seems like is that people have been manipulating on some level um, Namar uh, to battle, you know, um, surface dwellers again, I guess. Uh, and then you have this guy named Nguyen, like his last name. And he's like the mastermind behind this. He's kind of the bad guy. And he's put a device on Amadeus Cho and, f and the device has caused Amadeus to Hulk out more completely. So he looks a lot more like the Hulk Hulk, you know, like he's, a, he's bigger and, you know, he's not like as in control and he's not surfer dude looking like he, he's like Hulk looking. And, uh, and he's kind of appointed Amadeus to be king of this like territory of this island called Pan. And, uh, and that's what I'm gathering from this. So if I get any details wrong, let me know. But it's like, I'm only reading the final issue of the story. So I don't know what happened in issues one through four. Um, so you have these people underwater with Namar who are going to get in a civil war and then they're also going to get in a war with the, the you know uh, surface world I guess and it's all being manipulated by this guy named Nguyen but then you find out there's more to it uh, Jimmy Wu is there you know Jimmy Wu the agent um, and now he's you know agent of Atlas he's a member of that group and he's again like he's playing a chess piece so it's kind of him versus Nguyen and everyone's kind of in the middle and it, I don't know like I, I like Jimmy Wu I, I think that's the same character from uh from the Wanda uh, show, but also like um, from the Ant-Man movie. So I think it's the same character, but I really like the interpretation of him in the show where he's kind of like this, like, you know, nerdy guy, you know, who's learning magic tricks and things like that. This Jimmy Woo, and again, if it's the same character, I think I might be remembering the names wrong, but, uh, but this character, he's like, pretty intense and he's like a you know master manipulator like a Nick Fury type and so uh so I was like oh okay so I don't know much about the comic book counterpart to that character um 
and some of these characters in this I don't know that much about. I know a ton about Namor because I've read Fantastic Four my whole life, so I know a lot about Namor and what kind of person he is. But some of these other characters, it was kind of new to me. So there was, I think there was a character from uh, the a Marvel Future Fight game was in here, and, uh, and there's more of that you know, popping up in other books we'll talk about today. Um, and then also Silk from the Spider-Man universe, she's here too, and she's trying to like get through to Amadeus Cho and help him out. So that's pretty much the story is Amadeus Cho has been mind controlled. He's let loose on this area. He causes a tidal wave and then they rip the device off his chest. So now that he's no longer in control uh, or no longer under control, I should say by Nguyen, he goes and stops the tidal wave that he caused. Like he goes up and does a thunderclap, which slows the tsunami just enough for Namor and the others to like, you know, get back up and, 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 uh, um, you know, stop it from crushing Pan, like, you know, this, this territory that it's, uh, it was coming towards. Um, and they save like this woman and stuff like that and her family. So it's, I mean, it's a pretty straightforward story. Uh, it seems like I kind of liked it. I was like, oh, this is a neat concept. Um, and involving all these characters that I think most people don't think about too much or whatever. So I might actually, when this comes out in trade on Comixology, I might buy the whole thing just to read it for fun because I was like, oh, that's kind of neat. But it, it doesn't have anything to do with King and Black until the very last page when Jimmy Woo and some of the other people that he was working with and other agents of Atlas, um, including the dragon that was you know seen earlier in the story, like underwater, they all like, all right, well, we were trying to prep Amadeus Cho as the new king and see how strong he could be so that way he could help us against the coming battle with, you know, these dragons coming from space that, that you know, our satellites have picked up. And you're just like, what? And your satellites picked up dragons and you didn't warn the Avengers who, you know, found out like right when the dragons were nearing Earth, like, or something like, I don't know, there's, there's I don't know, it doesn't matter, I guess, or maybe this is after that, you know, I don't who who cares? Uh, but uh, but the, it felt very forced to just get that that Jimmy Woo has like been manipulating people so he could have more soldiers for the, the oncoming war. And it's kind of like, eh, I don't know. It just, it didn't seem, it, that part didn't work for me. I, it felt very forced, you know, the, the King and Black stuff. So, but that first issue, I was like, okay, that was all right. Like, I, I liked the story they were telling uh, by Greg Pak. Uh, you know, he's pretty good with Hulk stuff. And, you know, he did like Planet Hulk and things like that. So I was, I wasn't like upset. Like I was like reading this. I'm like, oh, it's a, not a bad story. Uh, it's kind of simple and very straightforward. But the King and Black stuff, I'm like, oh, it's, you know, it's clear they just put that banner on there to sell a lot of these books. And we'll get into that even more. Um, the second book we're going to talk about is Immortal Hulk. It's just a one shot, King and Black one shot uh, for Immortal Hulk. And uh, this is by Al Ewing, who is the writer of the Immortal Hulk series that's coming out right now, which I love. It's actually my probably my third favorite book at Marvel right now, uh, Daredevil definitely being my first. Um, but uh, but I, I've been liking Immortal Hulk. Like there's been some missteps here and there, but for the most part, it's been a pretty interesting Bruce Banner journey. And this one's pretty neat because Bruce has been going through these transformations lately, and the book is winding down to like near its end. So this issue, what's neat about it is that it's a um, it's enough said uh, I haven't seen one of these in a while uh, enough said is a, a series of books that came out Marvel did a while back where there's no dialogue it's just all visuals which you kind of are like well what did the writer get paid to do <laughs> but of course they have they structure things and they, they give notes and stuff to the to the artists and stuff so it's not like Aaron Cooter who did the art and who did a phenomenal job on the art by the way in this issue it's not like they did every single little thing there was still beats and stuff that probably came from from Al Ewing so um but this was just a, a simple story it's very simple it's twas the night before Christmas so I guess all of this null stuff happens like within Christmas, within a few days of Christmas, I guess. Um, so, uh, so probably like two nights leading up to Christmas and then Christmas itself. And then even though we're in the month of February now, the book is still taking place around Christmas. So, uh, this book starts off and it has, uh, someone just kind of like randomly wandering around town and then like they see the Hulk and, uh, and then he's, you know, just this, he's tall and kind of skinny looking. And then that person gets afraid and then runs into an alley and that's where they run into a null symbiote that devours that person. And then pretty much the rest of the book is Hulk versus this random nullified monster. And they like, you know, Hulk electrocutes it at one point. Um, and, then at, and then at one point he's getting shot at by cops after he thinks he kills the symbiote um, because he electrocutes it and he thinks it's dead. Then these two cops show up and shoot him and they, the bullets bounce off him, obviously. And then he's like screams at the cops and then runs away. And then as the cops are like, what you know they're kind of they don't say anything but they're like what the heck's going on then the symbiote 
gets back up and bonds with the two cops um, and merges with them. And then meanwhile, there's moments where, you know, Hulk is smashing things and he sees like this uh, like toy display in the window of a toy store. And then he gets memories of like his dad, you know, being abusive and like knocking over his toys or something like that on one of the holidays probably. And so Hulk starts to mutate back into Banner. Uh, and the mutation is, it's like awesome. It's like the thing, like, you know, the movie, the thing, it's like very body horror. It's gross looking, um, not like the typical version of you see when Hulk transforms. So if you haven't read a mortal Hulk, this will be, you'll be like, what the F is going on? But there's been a lot of crazy stuff going on in that book. Um, but he's back to Bruce Banner now, uh, fully equipped with like a handlebar mustache and stuff. Um, and that's when the cop car shows up. And I love this scene. The, the symbiote gets out of the cop car and it's got two heads. So it's the two cops merged uh, and it's got, you know, their two heads and stuff. I was like, holy cow, that's crazy. Um, so they come in uh, to the toy store. A banner kind of leads them in there because he can't transform back right now. So he leads them in, he cuts his feet on some glass, but then he puts on some bunny slippers so that he doesn't trail blood anymore. And he leads the blood trail to a certain point, puts on the bunny slippers and then hides and sets a trap. And what he does, he turns on all the speakers in the toy store. There's like a, a you know, an area where they sell music and, you know, TV sets and everything. And he blasts the symbiote with sound, which evaporates the symbiote. And you find out there's skeletons underneath. So the, this symbiote has already devoured the human host so i didn't know that was something they were doing like because they bonded with all the other superheroes and they're not skeletons so it's it's i'm just kind of curious i'm like wow that this, these things are skeletons already like why would it devour them like that why would these symbiotes devour them like that so uh, either that or the sound somehow killed the people inside the symbiote but um uh, maybe when the symbiote was ripping away it pulled their flesh and bones or their flesh and like organs out I don't know. I'm, I'm still kind of confused by that part because I'm like, did Hulk, did Banner just kill these cops or were they already dead by the symbiote? I'm going to guess they were already dead. Uh, but uh, but still, I don't know. It's it was like an intense scene. And then he after the, the sound blasts him, the symbiote still moving and he goes over with like a hair sprayer and a, like a, a match and he lights them on fire and then definitely burns them and kills them. And then after that, he just turns back into the Hulk and goes and plays with some toys in the toy store. <laughs> it's like literally that's all that happens. Um, so he just fights some one random creature and then him beating it, it doesn't like change or affect anything in King in Black. Like he he's not on a, a goal to go out and fight more of those things. Like that's it. And and that's fine because honestly, last time Donny Cates wrote Hulk in, a, in Absolute Carnage, it was a catastrophe because everyone was building up like, Oh my God, it's it's Hulk Venom, like it's Hulk Venom, and and Donnie was like, you guys aren't ready, you're not ready for for um, what do you call it, Volk or something like that. He's like, you're not ready for a Volk. This is gonna be so intense. And then the next issue, it's like two panels, and Carnage beats Hulk, and you're like, really? This is the thing you were hyping up. So I'm kind of I'm like, that's okay if Hulk's not part of King and Black, <laughs> like that's fine. But this issue for five bucks, and you don't even get any dialogue. It it's kind of, you're kind of like. <laughs> Okay, guys. All right, Marvel. But the art is beautiful. Like Aaron Cooter's artwork is awesome. So I don't know. I'm just kind of, I like, again, some of these I like the the concepts of. Like if you just change that symbiote monster out for anything else and you just had that not be part of King in Black um, and charge like $3.99 for it and it was just like a random issue of Immortal Hulk, but yeah, I probably would have liked it a little bit more. But the, the shoehorning in that has to be King in Black related, I'm like, uh, I don't know. I'm not a fan. Um, this next one we're going to talk about is one I was curious about because I said early on, I was like, you know, Donny Cates' run reminds me of someone doing uh, an, imp not an impression, I guess, but like almost pacing their story a lot like Jeff Johns did with Green Lantern. Like it kind of starts off with the, the retelling rebirth of the character. Um, so you kind of get that with, you know, Rex, the storyline with Rex and a little bit more with Abyss, I, I guess. Um, but then Abyss is also... Eddie atoning like he's like facing his sins like you know when he hit the kid when he was drunk when he was younger and he hit the kid with his car um and that's kind of like the second or third arc of uh Jeff John's Green Lantern was about the Green Lanterns that Jeff uh, that Hal Jordan apparently murdered but didn't actually murder or some of them were still alive so I saw a lot of parallels and then when you get to Absolute Carnage it's around the same numbering as Sinestro Corps War was and then now as we're getting into like issues 30 and stuff of uh, Venom uh I think it was issues 40 where um blackest night started and blackest night was basically this this you know god necron who was like the god of the dead or whatever coming back and resurrecting dead bodies and so i just saw a lot of parallels between that and what donnie's doing with null and that's why i've just kind of been 
bored a lot of times with some of this stuff, but I think the small character moments he does a good job on. But so of course, some people said, oh, you're reaching. There's no there's no comparison to that. Like Green Lantern's way different than Venom. And I'm like, I agree. But I still I don't know if you I don't know if you can really argue that the the, the similarities are pretty, pretty pretty consistent. Even more so is that right around uh, right after King and Black, they did a one shot storyline with Larflees, who is the Orange Lantern, where he looks for Santa Claus. And wouldn't you know it? We have a Santa Claus tie-in for King and Black with Iron Man and Doctor Doom. <laughs> um, so yeah, this was, uh, again, not a bad story if you just had it be part of anything else. Like if it was nothing to do with King and Black, you'd be like, okay, this is a fine standalone single issue story of either an Iron Man comic or a Doctor Doom comic. But to, you know, charge like five bucks for this like uh, King and Black tie-in, you know, it's a big, it's a big deal. It's not really. I mean, it ties in more than the other two books do because uh, this is, well, first of all, this is written by Christopher Cantwell, um, who does a great job on the Doctor Doom book, which I think unfortunately got canceled, but I love that book. It was awesome. Uh, one, of, It was my second favorite book at Marvel, uh, um, you know, and I think we have like one issue left or something like that. Um, but now it got knocked down and uh, Ghost Rider was up there too, but then Ghost Rider went away as well. So uh, Christopher Cantwell was a writer of this and Salvador Larocco is an artist. Um, and I've loved Salvador's work for many, many years. Done a lot of great stuff at Marvel over the years. And uh, and so this one, I was like, again, it ties a little bit more into King and Black because it's it deals with um, Tony being in his armor with like Extremis and like part of that dragon, uh, le that leftover dragon that's on him, like with the veins coming through. So, and he's kind of in control of it. So it's still dealing with that and it's dealing with him I guess feeling responsible that he got Eddie Brock killed. So that makes it feel like, okay, this is why it's tying in the King in Black. But beyond that, it's it's like whatever. It's again, they just throw a random symbiote thing on a random character, and then that's it. That's the story. So the book opens up with Tony when he's a kid, and he's talking to his dad, and his dad's like, Hey, see that building over there? I bought it for you. And he's like, Oh, he's like, or he's like, Yeah, Santa got it for you. And Tony's like, ah, I know the deal, deal, Dad. You know, there's no Santa. And he's like, What are you talking about? Santa totally got you this building. And he's like, And he, it's an investment. He, that's your present. Uh, and so you got to figure out what to do with this building and make money on it. And uh, and then I guess like so many years later, Tony does. He actually sells the building and makes a profit of like a ton of money, obviously. And he's like, Yeah, I'm sure my dad was looking down on me that day, proud of me. He goes, But uh, but still, the magic of you know. Christmas and Santa and all that like I still don't believe in that um, my dad told me I should have a little bit more faith that things like that are possible so that the world doesn't seem so cold and gray to me and that is a theme that pops up a lot in this so I kind of like that uh, Cantwell set that up in the beginning of this issue and then kind of pays off later on um, so again good writing techniques pretty decent story I like the setup okay Tony has this building so then it cuts to modern day after you know during the Null battle and Tony's looking over at that building and it's covered in symbiote. And then he's obviously covered it covered in extremist symbiote. And he's just like, yeah, well, there's the building. You know, my dad, you know, uh, got me even said it came from Santa and I made a profit off of it. And he's like sitting there kind of mourning the, the loss of Eddie. And he's like, he's like, I feel responsible that Eddie Brock died because I tried to come back and save him doing something that really made no sense. Like there was no science behind what my theory was. It was just a theory and it ended up not saving his life and now he's dead and his son had to watch him die and that's on me and then dr doom shows up and says you know i'd wonder if i died would you mourn me the way you're mourning this villain and tony's like well you know he's not really a villain and he's like what are you talking about he's like venom is a villain you know and like so obviously dr doom's not very up to date <laughs> on venom although at the same time dr doom is the guy who unleashed a venom bomb on new york so again maybe he just has a, that perception of like no venom's a weapon um but uh but there's a nice inter like there's some nice dialogue between these two where like you know tony's like you know why are you here and he's like well he's like i'm here because you know the world needs help and whenever the world needs help Dr. Doom is there to help it. And he's like, yeah, right. <laughs> he's like, you're, you're Dr. Doom. Like you want to rule the world. And he's like, right. So I don't want someone else to rule the world. Like, no. And he's like, so let's go do this. And then they look up in the sky and just right at that time, Santa Claus uh, rides by with a bunch of reindeer and Santa Claus is possessed or covered. He's nullified. He's been nullified. And he's like singing Christmas carols, but like dark versions of them. And he's, flying around New York uh, and and 
Tony's like, well, I don't know if that's the real Santa or not, but if he's going to be dropping off symbiote boxes of symbiotes to kids at their houses, you know, innocent children, I don't want anyone to get hurt. So we better go deal with this. And you're at the same time, you're like, isn't Null like eating half the city? Like, aren't there heroes that are dying? Like, that's what I mean about these King and Black tie-ins. Like, they, 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 they go like, ignore everything else that's happening in the King and Black battles. Um, and just focus on this one little thing. And like I said, I could if in the background you still saw chaos. But besides the one or two buildings being covered in, you know, symbiote goo, they pretty much just focus on this battle with Doctor Doom and, and Iron Man fighting evil Santa. And that's pretty much all they do. They, they take down evil Santa and, uh, and you know, destroy the symbiote that was on him. And then once they reveal the guy who was Santa... You know, Tony grabs his wallet and he's like, all right, this is, you know, Bob, whatever, from such and such. Like, he's just like a mall Santa. And then the Santa turns to him and goes, he goes, Victor, Tony. He goes, Tony, I understand you mean well. You know, he's like, so don't give up on yourself. And Victor, always up to, you know, no good. You know, basically, you, you've earned coal again this year. And he goes, but, uh, but maybe there's a chance that you could make the right decision again one day. And then he walks off. And then so Tony is just like, oh, you know, I'm a salesman. I know that that guy is just, he knows who we are. He knows I'm, you know, Iron Man is Tony Stark. He knows Dr. Doom is Victor Von Doom. And he knows a little bit about us. And he just was commenting on that uh, to, I guess, give us an illusion or he's still in character of being mall Santa. But Dr. Doom is the one now who's like, how would he know that stuff about us? And he's like, what are you talking about? He's like, you're in the papers. I'm in the papers. He's like, don't think, he's like, it's nothing supernatural. And Doom is the one at the end who's kind of going, but what if it is, what, what if it was Santa that we just saved, even though we killed all of his reindeer? Um, so there's a little bit of that, but I think at the end that the, the theme of cold and gray comes back where uh, it's Tony says that to the symbiote, uh, to the nullified Santa. And he's like, no, I don't, I don't want to believe the world is cold and gray. And then the Santa goes, yeah, it's black. Like we're going to make the whole world black. And Tony's like, well, I don't want that either. You know, like I don't want symbiotes covering the whole planet. So that's when they, blast santa and save save the guy inside but uh but you know destroy the symbiote but then i was like well how does that tie into the hulk thing because wouldn't that symbiote devour this santa like the way the symbiote devoured those two cops like i don't know who cares right um so uh so anyway this is what i mean when uh devin what's his name devin lewis or, or whoever the editor is on these uh books these venom books I thought the the group editing and the continuity between books was so bad in Absolute Carnage. It really was bad. Like, uh, oh, oh, to the point where, like, uh, they, they had this great setup in the Miles Morales book, and it had no payoff in the main book. Like, there were so many cool things set up in those different tie-ins that just didn't matter in the main book at all. The right hand was not talking to the left hand. It, and I don't know if it was Donnie not directly talking to those writers or if it was supposed to go through the editors, which typically it's supposed to, but no one was talking to each other. So those books were bad, like really bad. These books aren't badly written, in my opinion, and, and the ones we've covered so far and some of the ones we got coming up. But at the same time, like they don't really tie in. They don't, it doesn't matter that they're part of the King and Black storyline. Like this one a little bit more because Iron Man's, you know, infected or whatever. And that comes off of what happened in the books. But that's it. That's the only connection. You could have taken that out and still done a story, you know, with this, like at any other time. And it still would have been the same story for the most part. Like Tony could have mourned someone's death and then teamed up with Dr. Doom to save Santa Claus. Like you could have done that at any time. So it doesn't matter that it's part of King and Black. So that's my thing with this. So Devin, who was like, he came out and did an interview where he said, we need more tie-ins. All these events need more tie-ins. We need more, more tie-ins. Like, you know, and I'm like, you couldn't even get absolute carnage done well. And you want more tie-ins for King and Black. And look, he got them and they're just not that good in my opinion. Um, so yeah. So the, um, uh, the second to last book we're going to talk about today is Marauders. Uh, let me move on before I go on any more rants about the editing and stuff, uh, the group editing. Uh, cause it's, it's, it's garbage. And this one's another example. Like this isn't a, again, it's not a bad issue. Um, but it is like, it's not great either. It, it's, you're kind of like, why is it tie into King and Black? Um, so it's written by Jerry Duggan, 
Um, the art is by, I think, Lou Cross might be the artist. Uh, it starts off, and I thought it was going to be heavily involved in the King and Black stuff because it shows New York, and you see Storm and Cyclops, and they've been possessed by Null. You know, they're nullified. And then they talk about Eddie Brock falling off the building, and I'm like, oh, what's going to happen? So then they cut to Kitty Pride, and she has her own group. Um, it's like her, Iceman, Pyro, and Bishop. Now, I've been I've read like the first two or three issues of Marauders, but I dropped it pretty quickly. I think the premise of them kind of being pirates and going out there on the seas and, and handling business out there, I think that's neat. But I didn't think it was like, it's not like, I don't know. I, I, I'm not like, they didn't do anything really cool with it so far. Uh, and so I haven't liked it. So I haven't read the book, so I'm not up to what's going on. But a bishop was talking that he's kind of working with a beast and Emma Frost and that he was like selected to be the red bishop of this group. And they're out there on the road now, I mean, on the road, on the seas, on this cruise looking ship or this like this nice looking ship and not a pirate ship, but like this nice looking ship, uh, more modern. And they're out there and they have a mission. They have to, uh, you know, go into the docks of New York and go in and save Storm and Cyclops. And I'm like, hey, this is cool. This is a cool story. Like, I'm very excited. And then guess what happens? It doesn't tell that story at all. <laughs> Instead, you find out that on this, they find another ship and they get a direct distress call that out in the ocean with all the, the clouds, you know, all gone because the sky turned black and dragons everywhere. The waters are rising and it's causing everything to, you know, uh, boats are sinking and stuff. So they get a distress call from another boat and they go over to save that boat and the crew's there and they're like, hey, thanks. Thanks for getting us off. So then they hear this noise under the deck and they're like, wait, what was that noise? And then they look down there and they see that there's a group of immigrants that have been, uh, I guess, they're being transported somewhere by this crew. So Kitty turns to the crew and is like, you monsters, like you're actually transporting people. Like, and, and they're like, no, it's not what you think. And they're like, she's like, whatever. And she goes, uh, let's just teleport these crew members away. So they open up, you know, the Krakoa teleportation thing. And Iceman drops them off like in the middle of the desert. And although the desert, it's not that bad because the sky is all black. Uh, so it's not like super hot out. But he, so Iceman's like, hey, we're going to leave you here. It's like a half a day walk that way to the next city. That's your punishment for what you're doing. And be be grateful that we're this merciful on you or whatever. Um, and so then I'm like, okay, so wait, are they going to go save Storm? And Because, I, I mean, okay, great. You're, you're telling this story where they have to go save these immigrants on a boat that's sinking and stuff. I'm like, that's fine. But why is this happening in the middle of King and Black? Like, you had a setup. Let's go save Storm and Cyclops. Let's go affect the story of King and Black. And then they derail to do this other thing. And again, it's not badly done. It's it's a neat story. And I'm like, okay, it's one that, you know, I would, if again, if it was a random issue of Marauders that didn't tie into King and in Black, I would be like, okay, this is pretty good. Like, I like this. Um, but unfortunately, it's not. It's part of King and Black. And they start by saying what their mission is. And then they proceed not to do the mission at all. So after they save these people, you find out that the, this, this woman who's kind of speaking for the group, she says, well, we paid these men to take us to Canada or somewhere. Um, and she's like, but then they kind of, I guess they're taking us somewhere else. Like, they, like they, they're they you know betraying us or whatever, uh, and they're gonna go sell us off or whatever they're gonna do. So, but we paid them to take us somewhere and they decided not to, because they were like, oh, we're gonna take you to America. They're like, no, we weren't going to America. We were, we were trying to go to Canada. Um, so so that was kind of the story. So, that, so so a couple of dragons come down. Lockheed fights like a dragon at one point. Um, it's like real quick, happens in the background. Kitty Pride and everyone, you know, Pyro and Iceman use their powers to fight the symbiotes. It's like a couple pa panels and off a couple pages, and that's pretty much it. I mean, this book doesn't, again, if this was just a story about them, you know, doing this one thing, helping this group of people, you know, on a random issue of Marauders, you'd be like, okay, cool. And I think that's probably what this was. Like a lot of these issues feel like the scripts were already turned in. And then, you know, Devin or some editor like, you know, contacted these writers and said, hey, can you tweak your story a little bit to make it, you know, affect, you know be part of King and Black somehow? And they just did it in the most dumbest way possible, which is like, oh, we'll help a symbiote or two show up. But none of these books really matter to King and Black. This is why I wanted to avoid, uh, you know, uh, reading them and buying them. Uh, and I knew I was just, this, all the stuff I've said so far in this episode, I felt like I knew I was going to say this kind of stuff. I was going to say, you know, I didn't know if I was going to like the books or not. So that was a surprise to me. So I, I'm glad I do at least appreciate the books for what stories they are telling but they're just not King and Black stories. <laughs> so I knew they weren't going to tie into King and Black that much or feel that connected because normally tie-ins don't. But uh, but I thought I was also going to not like the books. The books are okay. The books we've talked about so far, they're not bad. They're just 
Uh, they're just like, why are they part of King in Black kind of thing? Um, and so the, at the book ends with the woman who was like speaking for the group, she sees Magneto and Magneto's like, look, um, you know, people are going to tell stories about Krakoa and that we're an island of war and all this other stuff, you know, in the days to come. But I want you to tell everyone what we are, which is we're a, an island of mercy and we allowed you humans to be here temporarily until we can get you back to Canada. So we actually let um, some humans hang out on this part of this island uh, on Krakoa, which is normally against the rules, but he let it happen, I guess, this one time. So, uh, or it was like an island nearby or something. So anyway, um, not, whatever, <laughs> it doesn't matter. But again, if you want to tell that story of like helping these immigrants get to where they need to go, that's fine. That's a that's a that's not a bad X-Men story to tell, but when you're part of King and Black and you're setting up in the first few pages, we got to go save Cyclops and Storm, and then you proceed not to do that at all. You're just like, well, then why why do that? Why do that in this book? Um, this next one, though, I think is the, the best of this lot. This is the last book we're going to talk about tonight. This is the best of the lot, in my opinion. Um, this is King and Black, The Black Knight. Uh, this book started off, and I, I didn't like the first couple pages of it. I was like, oh, God, this is, I'm not interested. I certainly put my foot in my mouth by the end. Uh, this is written by Simon Spurrier, and the artist Jesus Sayez, and it's a gorgeous book. Holy cow, is it gorgeous. Uh, the art is phenomenal. The story's really fun. I am not a Black Knight fan. I don't dislike the character. I just don't know much about him. I, I really don't know that much about the character. Um, I know he's going to be in the Eternals movie, uh, played by the guy from Game of Thrones, who was also in the second Silent Hill movie, which was terrible. Um, but uh, but I think he played Jon Snow or something like that. I don't know. I haven't seen Grand Game of Thrones either. So don't kill me. Don't kill me. Um, but uh but yeah so dane whitman i think is his name he's uh again this is just part of the marvel universe i'm not very familiar with so when i was reading this i'm like okay he's kind of a fool he's kind of like a he's kind of the idiot you know who got um he got lucky by becoming a superhero with this sword this uh special sword called uh the ebony the ebony blade and uh and so i guess this ebony blade ties into the lore of the symbiotes and now that they've like you know ever since Donny Cates came on and they started tweaking things. And I think even maybe even a little bit before they were kind of setting things like that up. So it appears this ebony blade that, that uh, the black Knight holds Dane holds um, it is, it could be essential into hurting Null or at least weakening his army. And so he's remembering like the sword is, I guess, showing him images and stuff of like the time it, uh, from when he met Spider-Man before. Cause he's like, wait a minute, I know these dragons that are coming up in the sky. I remember these type of beings before, not dragons specifically, but like alien goo type beings, like symbiotes basically. And it, it shows an image from the symbiote Spider-Man comic that's currently coming out, which is three issues in, which Black Knight is also in, but that takes place back like years ago when Peter Parker was in the Venom costume. So, um, so the, or the, the symbiote, you know, so, uh, so they show that. So again, we'll cover that book at some point, but I'm going to wait till all five issues come out before we cover it. So we'll definitely be talking about Black Knight again, for sure. But, uh, so they reference that storyline and what's going on with Mr. E, the, the Captain Universe villain from back in the day and, uh, and every, and Merlin and all that stuff. So that's going on over in the symbiote Spider-Man book. So they, they have a reference to it here, but then the, the book, like I said, um, with the blade kind of whispering into it's been lately whispering into dane's head to kill it's like kill 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 and it's becoming more murderous and more evil and the reason being is because null has been coming to earth so now that null is here it's speaking to dane through the sword and it's showing him all these images and it's like yeah percy the ghost that you see that is trying to help you become you know a hero percy was a fool too just like you 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 aren't built for hero stuff you weren't chosen by merlin because you're you're good of heart or that you're you know whatever you've been chosen because you're a fool and you can be duped easily and you're and you have an ability to kill um and so that's why you've been chosen so Noel is basically trying to uh you know like all evil people do they lie to the hero to try to get them to doubt themselves so at this point uh, we dane is doubting himself he's like you know what i uh i, I i'm not going to be able to beat this guy now and and even though he has the sword that could possibly do it he now doubts himself so as he's doubting himself a dragon shows up he attacks it um and he shoves his sword into it and it kills the dragon but then it he falls off the dragon and the sword is stuck in it and it, the dragon crashes somewhere um nearby in another in a city nearby 
and Dane fall, is falling to the ground. Well, Arrow, um, A-E-R-O, Arrow, I like flying, she catches him. And she's a character from the Marvel Future Fight video game. So it was kind of neat because I was like, oh, that's cool. I wasn't expecting her to be here. And then also Swordmaster, who's another character from the from the video game. Who And I've been leveling up both those characters uh, over the years, you know, that I've been playing the game. So it's been kind of fun, you know, having them. Uh, Swordmaster, I think, is more of a recent one, I think, they added. I can't remember, uh, like, maybe in the last year or so. But, uh, but I, I kind of like the guy in the game. He's kind of neat. And he's got a special sword too so there's scenes in this where you know black knight has to team up with these two kids basically he's got uh the you know sword master and arrow and they're fighting dragons and stuff and they're they're um in i can't remember what city they're in but uh i want to say they're in maybe japan somewhere or somewhere uh overseas but uh but they are talking about wanting to go to new york because that's where null is uh but uh sword master he's got his own lore with his sword and his sword was uh, is special because it once defeated a demon. So Null, using an avatar, actually shows up in this area they're fighting in as the... But he transforms his avatar to look like that demon that Swordmaster has to fight. So I thought that was really cool. I thought Simon Spurrier did a good job of like referencing a lot of stuff of Black Knight's history, but also Swordmaster, who's a newer character's history, and then having Arrow be this person who was kind of like all right, boys, stop fighting. She's kind of like the motherly figure between the two of them because uh, because Black Knight it actually at one point takes Swordmaster's sword unintentionally. He's trying to summon his sword, but Swordmaster's sword goes into his hand. And then Swordmaster, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, then Black Knight uses it to kill a dragon, but he kills it like way too much, <laughs> like, like way too much. And that's when they're like, see, he's he's crazy. You know, he's an ex-Avenger because um, he's the whole time Dane is like, wait, I'm a Avenger adjacent. What did they label? They labeled him as Avenger adjacent. But so anyone during a big battle like this, if they're Avengers adjacent, they get called to the front lines. So he's like, wait a minute, I'm Avenger adjacent. And then so Arrow turns out she is too. And then they kind of recruit Swordmaster, who's not a Avengers adjacent, but kind of becomes it and earns that title throughout this issue. So this one I like because they're actually taking the fight to Null. Null appears, talks to them, has an interest in Black Knight and his ebony sword, has an interest now in Swordmaster and his new like green light sword, which seems to hurt Null. And together they all team up and they kill the Null avatar at the end of the book, um, which is pretty awesome. And like sword, uh, Black Knight gets his original ebony blade back and him and Swordmaster just go and, you know, they're lifted up in the air by Arrow because she has like wind and powers and stuff. And she lifts them up and they go and take down this giant Null avatar thing, um, which is pretty cool. And then, like I said, while that's happening, Null is inside Black Knight's brain trying to like warp his mind, create doubt and get him to, you know, stop fighting and, you know, and eventually give up. But uh, Dane powers through and says, you know what? I, I am worthy. Like I'm, I'm not a fool. I'm not just a fool. Like I, I have the power to do great things and I have the power to, uh, to not just be the idiot who gets lucky. Like I'm not just that. I'm more than that. And I'll prove it. And he actually earns the ability to pick up the ebony sword again, which wasn't calling to him when he was trying to summon it, much like Thor sometimes will be like, where's my hammer? And it, you know, if it doesn't come to him. So it was kind of like that. And so now he's able to pick up the sword again and he leads the charge and they destroy that avatar so i thought that was really awesome and it everyone played a part arrow had a big part to play in it of rallying the troops and then helping them get up to the point where they could you know get the final blows in she could use her powers uh sword master had a purpose in it and his sword revealed more truths to black knight and his mission and also scared Null because Null was like what is this thing and then also black knight had his sword and his journey that he was going on and this arc of being like a fool but a fool that embraces, you know, something. And I'm, I'm, like I said, I don't know enough about this character. So maybe that's a story they've done before. I have no doubt in my mind. They've probably done that story where Dane is like a fool or whatever, like how they describe him. And then he, you know, nuts up and becomes a hero. So I'm sure that's been done before. But this is one of my first experiences with that, with the character. So I, I dug it. I, I just, I was like, well, for a single issue story that had an arc for all their characters, had a purpose for each character, and it also feeds into the overall King and Black story. And then at the end, they said, where are we going now? And Dane's like, we're going to New York. And Arrow's like, yeah, we are. And they all fly up in the air. She lifts them all up and they're heading off to New York to, you know, to go battle, um, which I hope they take another means of transportation. I don't, I don't know how long it'll take to fly across the ocean with her wind powers. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe they can go really fast. I don't know. Um, but either way, it was a cool shot at the end, that Jesus draw where all of them are going up in the air. Um, so I loved it. I actually, I liked this issue a lot. I think the Black Knight issue by Simon Spurrier 
in this episode, it's by far my favorite. I saved the best for last. It's my favorite issue that ties in a King and Black because I felt like it mattered. They took down an avatar of Null. Null is aware that they're on their way, that they each have magical swords. Whether Even if there's no major, major payoff with these characters in another book, they at least had a big moment in this book. And I hope they do at least show up for the final battle against Null in the fifth issue of uh, King and Black. But, you know, with the way the editing has been, I don't think so. So I think that's why Simon was like, let's just give him a big moment here because it's probably not going to pay off in the main book. And I think that was a smart move, Simon Spurrier, because <laughs> I don't think I don't think most things that were set up in Absolute Carnage tie-ins paid off in the main book at all. Like it was like Donnie was doing his own thing and everyone else was just like, hey, here's here's a cool setup for my character that I write monthly. Will you do something with Miles Morales? No. But, hey, will you do something with Scream? No, <laughs> like it's like, yeah, they, I just oh, bad all around. But this I actually enjoyed. I, I really like this uh, King and Black tie-in. I thought Black Knight, best issue of the bunch. So in my recommendation, and first again, I got to say, like I know I'm critical of things, uh, but Cam, I greatly appreciate you sending these to me because like I said, I thought I was just going to dislike all these books. I dislike them as tie-ins, but I actually kind of enjoyed them as regular books. I'm really surprised by that. Um, I did not feel it was a waste of my time to read any of these. I'm glad I got to talk about them and share them with you guys. And we'll definitely do more tie-ins coming up. Um, I'll probably wait till some of the miniseries finish. Like, because I think some of them are two, three issue miniseries. I'll probably wait and just do a video on like all of, you know, um, Planet of the Symbiotes and, and all of the Black Cat issues and all the Spider-Woman issues. I'll probably just wait till they all finish and then we'll, we'll cover all of them. And especially since um, King and Black 5 was delayed. It gives me more time to, you know, to wait for those final issues to come out and make videos on them. But we'll get more of them very soon. And I think I could probably do a second video of this in the next week or so. And then after that, we might have to wait for a few more issues to come out. Um, but this was, honestly, these issues are not bad. I didn't think anyone who wrote them did a bad job telling a story that was focused on those characters. But I just didn't feel like it made any sense for them to be King and Black issues except for the Black Knight one. Honestly, um, Marvel could have just, the thing is, the sad thing is, is those other books probably wouldn't have sold. I mean, they certainly, Cam, uh, you know, Cam who donated these, Cam Fraser would not have bought those issues to no donate them to the channel if they didn't say King and Black on them. So it, it worked on some level for sure. But at the same time, I'm glad I did read them because I didn't feel like they were bad stories. I just don't see why they have to have anything to do with King and Black. Like I said, you can take out the Eddie Brock death thing. And the Iron Man story and Doctor Doom, you could have told that in a random issue of any one of their books. Um, so when I see stories like that, where it's clearly all you got to do is pluck one thing out and you can still tell the same story, then that story is not essential at all to the book it's it's saying it's tying into. And that's how I felt about all these. None of them tie in at all. Even if they have like a little dragon in there or like, a, like one panel with Null or something like that, none of them matter to the story except Black Knight. So if you're out there and you're like, hey, I need to get one or two tie-ins, I recommend uh, the Black Knight one-shot. That's a tie-in you should buy for King and Black. It's really good. Any other ones? Not bad books, just terrible, terrible King and Black tie-ins. So let me know what you think. If you agree with me, disagree with me. Cam, definitely, I want to know your thoughts because obviously you read the physical copies and you donated the, the digital ones to us. So I want to hear your thoughts on these issues. Let me know down in the comments below. And everyone, please show some love to Cam. Uh, that was really cool to donate all these issues to us. And, you know, hopefully I didn't like bum you out by being, you know, kind of critical of them, Cam. But uh, but I obviously I always like to give my honest opinion. These books weren't bad. They were just terrible tie-ins. And, uh, you know, what? and actually um, I'm kind of intrigued to read the Namor one now because I think the, the Atlantis Attacks number five, that's supposed to set up the Namor book. So I have those. Cam donated the first like two or three issues of Namor to us. So I don't. Maybe I won't wait for all five. Maybe I'll read the first two or three, and we'll do a video on those. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'm I'm kind of intrigued to read that. See what happens to Amadeus Cho and Silk, and see if they pop up in there. See what happens to Namor after that book. I'd like to see where he goes from here. Um, but I think that's still a prequel. So some of these tie-ins they say are prequels to King and Black, like Symbiote Spider-Man is, and I think the Namor book is. But I still kind of want to see what story they tell. Um, and if it's still a good story, I'll still, you know, I'll be happy about that. But uh, but I again, I feel like this is just that editor just going, we need more tie-ins, we need more tie-ins. And they're just slapping, you know, King and Black on everything, which from a business standpoint, that's kind of their job. They're supposed to do that. But God dang, from a creative standpoint, it's these books, I think, would have been better 
uh, if they didn't have anything to do with King and Black, if they just told like good personal single issue stories um, in their main monthly books. I think that would have been way better, except for Black Knight. This one was awesome. So let me know your thoughts down below. And as always, we'll continue our conversation down there. And we'll definitely have more tie-in issues to talk about very soon. And like I said, I think I have enough to do another episode this long and I'll probably do it next week. And then that should catch us mostly up on the tie-ins, minus some of the miniseries, like the three-issue miniseries. So, you know, we'll get to those when they finish up too. So, you know, I'll, I'll stay on top of this stuff and I'll try to get more stuff to you guys very soon. Thanks so much. See you in the future. Peace.